How did our personal information become the most sought after commodity in the world? Call it out, Blue Cross, Office of Personnel Management, you name it, 80 million, 100 million, 120 million customers, individual personal information. They're being attacked to find your stuff. So just some big facts, you name the industry sector, you name what the business is that they're in, they've been hacked, your personal information has been stolen. You know, we used to read about cyber risk is around cyber espionage, cyber warfare, hacktivism, right? Now it's cyber crime. In fact, over half of the breaches are now cyber breaches for criminal profit. A very small percentage relatively is around those more traditional, which you might want to call institutional or large enterprise matters. In fact, it's gone so far the James Clapper, who's our U.S. Director of National Intelligence, said almost a year ago, rather than a cyber Armageddon, he envisions something very different, an ongoing series of low to moderate level attacks. That's you and me, our small businesses, our professional practices, our families, our home offices, way down the food chain from these large enterprises. And it's not just the nuclear reactors and the electrical utility grid, it's us as a nation all the way down to each one of us as individuals. And that's why I call this the personalization of cybersecurity. So what I'd like to do today to, to uh, set the stage for what we're gonna talk about is, number one, how did this happen? What's it look like for the next couple of years? Is it gonna get better or is it gonna get worse? And finally, what can you do about it? And I'm going to tell you some things at the end of the presentation. You can't eliminate any risk, but you can mitigate it substantially with a few basic things and a couple of more things that are less than, a little more than basic and seriously manage this risk and mitigate it tremendously for you and those around you. How did cyber risk become the number one risk at every level of our society? Every level. How did our personal information become one of the most sought after commodities on the planet? It all started with mobile. In fact, Steve Jobs got it right. Does anybody remember that day in January 2007 when the Big Apple event was held and we saw the world's first iPhone? Does anybody remember that? I remember right where I was. I was a Big Apple fan. I love Steve Jobs. And there he was, right? And he's like, this changes everything. And he's going like this. We'd never seen that before. We're scrolling and all these sort of uh, gesture movements. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. That marks the moment of when a lot of things changed dramatically. He wasn't talking about the iPhone. He was talking about the smartphone, which is really a computer, a mobile computer in your hands. This changes everything. To accommodate everybody on their mobile computer, wanting now to do everything on their mobile computer and live their lives hubbing off these mobile uh, devices, the, the market economy, if you will, has accommodated that with clouds. Now clouds, you know, sometimes at first that's kind of a hard concept, what's a cloud? A cloud is just somebody else's computer, just somebody else's server. That's where all the heavy lifting is being done. That's where all your information is. So you don't have to have it all on this, you just have to have a connection. And now with these really fast connections, broadband connections and Wi-Fi, we can use somebody else's computer, whether it's Merrill Lynch's, or whomever it is, to do the heavy lifting and hold our personal information so we can truly be mobile anywhere in the world and do almost anything that we want. To the point that by 2020, 80% of the population on Earth, including the most remote areas that you can think of, will have a supercomputer in their hands. This phenomenon, the mobile phenomenon, is the fastest, fastest spreading technology in the history of the planet. The steam engine, the cotton gin, the television, computers, even the internet itself and email, none of those compare to the uptake that we've all experienced with our mobile devices. We're now all using these and hubbing our lives around these things. It's a real important sort of driver to what we're experiencing today. So if there's all that information out there and it's ubiquitously available 
you know, so what? What do you do with it? Well, not only has you know, the hardware and the technology advanced, but so has the software. Is anybody familiar with the term big data? This is a term you'll want to know. It's a formal term. They capitalize it. Big B, big D, big data. And if you read the IBM annual report, Cisco's annual report, really almost anybody's annual report these days, a lot of resources are going into big data. Big data is very powerful software that can sort and sift all this information like this and find common denominators, connect the dots, visualize this information so that you can take tons of information that would be meaningless otherwise and glean very important nuggets of knowledge. And this is what's coming into the hands of malicious actors that are using this combination of an ether of inf information, of a very powerful computing devices that can go anywhere any time and very powerful software to take all that information and mine it for something that they can use to further whatever their agenda is military criminal whatever it is it gives them an optimized edge and that's why the, every company you know in the country wants to use this software to understand their consumers better to make predictions more accurately to strategize corporately and with their uh, budgeting in the most effective way. It's a, it's a revolution of knowledge that is really transformational uh, today. So you have to ask yourself, wow, you know, so mobile, fastest ever, supercomputer in my hand, software that can take all this nonsense and what seems really sort of, again, mundane, boring information and make it something that's very valuable, you know, how does that happen? How does that happen so quickly? Crucial concept number one, Moore's Law. Gordon Moore was one of the inventors of the semiconductor. Gordon Moore started a company called Intel. Maybe if you saw the Super Bowl, you see a lot of the advertisements for Intel. Intel inside. Intel is the chip, the brain of a computer. It takes all that, those bits and processes them into something that makes sense for us. And after he invented it, which was just over 50 years ago, by the way, he said, this is amazing, um, but I'm already seeing a trend. He said, we're seeing that we can double the power of these things every 18 months or so, but it'll only cost us half as much to produce. Think about that. Double the power at half the cost. Double the output at half the cost every 18 months. We'd never seen that in the past. Think if you're in a conventional business, you're in mining, you're in real estate, you're in labor management, you are in any conventional business. Let's use uh, the steel industry or the oil business. If you want to grow your business and actually manufacture more steel, uh, refine more oil, you need more natural resources. You need more people. You need more bricks and mortar infrastructure. You need more transportation. And you might grow from one to 1.1, if you're really lucky, 10%. One to 1.1, that's 10% growth. In a steel company, an oil company, that's big growth. These guys are going, we're going 100% every 18 months at half the cost. That's a value equation that had never been seen before and is a crucial concept to understand because it's driving your experience in everyday life personally and professionally today. And in looking back, I mean, he's a multi-billionaire now, he's a true hero in the world of tech. He said, I didn't think it'd be so precise. And this is why we have a supercomputer in our hands today. And you can extrapolate that to know everybody's gonna be able to afford one by 2020. So, this is part of crucial concept number one. And I'm not going to get into math or anything else, but I hope you'll stay with me, with me because this is enormously important today. What we're talking about is exponential change. That's an exponential rate of progress. That's not going 1 to 1.1, like a steel company or an oil business, right? That's, it, that's unseen before progress. That's because technology moves and progresses at exponential rates, doubling every 18 months, doubling again doubling again at half the cost, at half the cost, right? Tremendous driver of, of change. But you and I, as biological 
beings, as humans, and the way that we relate to our surroundings as we have since humankind has been around is linear. Our steel companies grow 10%, maybe 5%. Our oil companies, 5%, 10%. Our ability to learn and adapt, the doubling of something where it can start so small, like the first chip, but it progresses so quickly that it eventually envelopes everything. It takes everything around it over because it is progressing so quickly, which is why technology is all around us, right? And continues to be all around us. The cars coming from Detroit get shipped connected to the internet now, right? Chips are everywhere because they're so powerful and so cheap. Again, our sort of biological wiring, we've got to come out of that and think, kind of transcend that to really understand some of these notions. Albert Bartlett, a noted uh, professor of physics at University of Boulder, Colorado, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. It's not because it's hard math. That's not the point. The point is that our intuition, our biologically wired intuition operates numerically. It's very hard to relate to, so we always underestimate what exponential progress really means to us and around us. And so this is what happens, right? You are here, but life is up there, right? And it says, watch the gap. And I have a delta sign, which means the difference between one thing and another, the gap. And when you have a gap between the way you perceive and what's actually going on around you, what happens is apathy, fear, confusion, even denial. I call this the WTF slide. <laughs> Whiskey, tango, foxtrot, right? What the heck is going on, right? And that's, uh, I can tell that that's the way a lot of us feel. So the rate of change in our everyday lives is actually accelerating and it's getting away from us and it's leaving us very disoriented, which can be hazardous if we don't think about it. And that's how we got here, because very smart people know that we're scratching our heads. And they have hacked. This is the trade that hacked our democracy. They have arbitraged their understanding of the value of information, personal information including, and our sort of naivete or confusion or apathy around it. And that's why everything is free. Free email accounts free Facebook accounts, free Instagram accounts. Yet, these are the largest fortunes built ever in history over the shortest period of time. Guess who is the loser of that trade? We are, because we give it away for a free Gmail account, right? We don't get it. So we give all of our stuff to them and they create enormous wealth and keep giving you more things for free. And they'll work that trade until you start to get it and start to evaluate a little bit differently. And that's gonna be a little while. So to make the joke, we have the cartoon. Isn't it great that we pay nothing for the barn? Even the food is free, says the pig. We've gotta be very careful about what we decide to do for free. There is no free lunch, we all know that. And when we look at the results and we look at where the 25-year-old the billionaires that are all over our economy these days, look at what they're doing. They're arbitraging our misunderstanding of the value of information and their deep understanding of the value of information and exploiting it. It's exactly what's happening. So that's how we got to this point. We are out there, we're totally exposed, we're completely vulnerable. The world continues to get away from us and accelerating. Remember what happens. Remember, doubling every 50 years, you know, it starts from nothing. It's like it doesn't matter. And then it starts to double and double, and then it starts to matter. Next thing you know, your hockey stick. We are, after 50 years of doubling, in a hockey stick. Change is accelerating to the point where it's blowing our minds and very, very hard to keep up with. That's how we got here. So what does that mean for the next few years? I'm gonna say the next three to five years, this has some relevance. Beyond that, it's very, very hard to see. But we're gonna extrapolate some of these things because again, there's a lot of science here in terms of technology to understand the nature, the nature 
of cybercrime and trends in hacking technology. Cybercrime has the nature of technology, not the nature of the steel or oil business or a traditional enterprise business that we think of. So it is able to grow and proceed, and one person is able to do a lot of damage as a result of the nature of cybercrime. And the other side of that, we'll get into the empowering piece in a little bit. The, what are the trends in this technology to protect ourselves? Because we can play that game too. And so one of the things that, we'll, that we'll, we're seeing now and we're going to really continue to see over the next three to five years is what's called the Internet of Things, the IoT. And this is where, again, computing power becoming so cheap and yet so powerful that these things are going to be everywhere. Again, the, this is very sort of calculable. Uh, you can really count on it. It's almost uh, guaranteed. And as a result of all this connectivity, it's like, you know, the cloud was connecting us. This is going to connect us to the point where it's a fabric of our lives, right? Where computer chips and information and connectivity are a fabric of our everyday living. I mean, we have more information at our fingertips than the president of the United States had 10 years ago on the internet. But by 2020, this information that we have today will have increased tenfold and will double every 72 hours. That's a lot of information. Information is unusual. We're used to supply and demand. Information is different. The more you have of it, the more valuable it becomes. And digital currencies, finally. Again, we're talking about what to expect here over the next three to five years. Digital currencies, bitcoins, are here to stay. There is not the requirement for cash or credit cards or a financial institution to clear the transaction and record the transaction. It is here to stay. In fact, IBM is in about the seventh inning of developing a technology where you won't even need a Bitcoin account. You can have yen or pounds or dollars and do a digital currency transaction, buy or sell something without even having a Bitcoin account. That's going to change everything. But think about bitcoins. This is wealth or money or currency that is anonymous, liquid, and portable. So it starts with all these bits, ones and zeros. That's what technology is. And then you have Gordon Moore's chips, right? And we have all this ether of information on the internet of things, all these ones and zeros, which are really just random nonsense, noise, mean nothing yet but the bits are processing them so we can look at them on our mobile device and make sense out of them and it's colorful and it's fun and we're flicking back and forth. And our information used to be held in folders on our computer, right, at home or someplace, you know, that you get your arms around. Now it's out there in the cloud. Then you apply big data. So you're extracting knowledge out of all that random noise, seemingly random noise. And what's knowledge? It's power. Knowledge is power. They knew that back when they had pigeons. Think of the Rothschild dy dynasty, right? If there was a battle taking place someplace in Europe, somebody would put a note in a pigeon, one of the Rothschild me family members would get it. Wow, this side lost the battle. Buy the other side's currency, sell our property over there, do all their, because they had the information early. It gave them the power to create wealth. So when you have this sort of alchemy transaction of taking all this random noise that is everywhere and, and just proliferating and accelerating and extracting knowledge out of it, you're putting a lot of power into whomever wants to do that. And as we know, it's very powerful and very cheap and getting more powerful and cheaper. That means anybody can do it if it's out there and translate that into wealth, into Bitcoin, no less. Anonymous, portable, and liquid. A profit motive? You better believe it. Trustwave, multi-billion dollar company out of Chicago, does a lot of work for global companies around cybersecurity in, in 2015. In our research into underground markets, we've estimated that cyber criminals today enjoy a return on investment of 1,425% monthly. Darren?
Yeah. <laughs> That's what you got last month, isn't it? Yeah, right. For your clients? <laughs> Monthly. 1,425% month. You know what as a service means? Everything is going as a service, right? Um, software as a service. And you pay by the month. That's software as a service. This is crime as a service. They really don't have to hack or be um, uh, coders at all. They rent the software, the bad stuff, the viruses, for about $3,000 a month. No capital investment. Everybody wants in on this game. This is your new face of risk. So what's happening is the most sophisticated criminal cartels, syndicates in the world are getting into this game. Why would you smuggle drugs when you can do 1,425% a month from your couch in the Ukraine? Why would you rob a bank? You know, bank robberies are way down. Only idiots and drug addicts rob banks, okay? This is the crime of today, much less the future. This is your new face of risk. And so what are they doing with that information? Um, but ransomware is um, where suddenly you come into your computer, or your smartphone for that matter, it's mostly on, on fixed computers right now, and you start it and suddenly there's a message in front of you and it says, we basically have control of your computer, Mr. Deflin, and you have one hour, 59 minutes, 59 seconds, 59 minutes, 58 seconds, to send us $300 in bitcoins to this bank account. And if you don't, your computer will be useless and all the information on your computer will, gone, will be gone. You know, we'll check back with you in 59 minutes and 38 seconds. Tick, tick, tick. And if you don't do it, your computer's gone and all your information, it's extortion. It's the evolution of extortion. You don't have to have anything to hide to still have a lot to lose. And a lot of people will say, they're not gonna target me. They're exactly targeting you because you were least defended. Your information is very liquid and they can do it in high volume, which means a lot of money. And that's why James Clapper said, yes, those big cyber Armageddon threats are a problem, the bigger problem, number one problem to national security and our economic stability is our stuff, electronically. But this is a really important point and really the purpose of this slide to sort of segue away from just sort of that criminal, cyber criminal idea. There's a rapid convergence between cyber crime and what you would call physical or, or, or uh, traditional crime. Assaults, burglaries, kidnapping, all right? where those traditional crimes can now be optimized with information. Their chances of being successful without getting caught are higher when they have a lot of information. If I'm gonna rob that house, when are they on vacation? When are they coming home? What's the maid look like? We're not gonna be able to distinguish cyber crime from traditional crime, it's all converging. So what can you do about it? And here's where we get into the flip side of that and hopefully the empowering element of, of today's presentation because there's a lot you can do about it that will really make a difference. You can't use the same password on every account. You can't use one, two, three, four, five, six. You can't use P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. You just can't use, you know, very predictable numbers anymore. Um, and the math behind a good password is it should be long, it should be complicated, and it should be unpredictable. So they have a lot of uh, pre-populated answers that they'll put in and they'll run. And nine times out of 10, one of those will work. One, two, three, four. Or one of these sort of commonly used passwords. How do you make a 14 character password? You can't. We are not wired to remember too many passwords, much less at 14 characters. You have to use a password manager. You just do, get used to it. They're much better, they're easy to use. It syncs across all your devices. You can be on your pad, your smartphone, your home computer, it's all synced. It'll pre-populate, really make your life easy. It'll generate new passwords. And you only have to remember one master password. And I'll tell you how to do that. One master password that is long, over 14 characters, complicated and unpredictable. Hash it up, as they say. And I could memorize that and maybe write it down and put it in my sock drawer. And that's all I have to remember to get all my other passwords in my password manager.
So if you use a password manager and you think of a, of a phrase that you grew up with or you're familiar with and you hash it up a little bit so it's unpredictable, you've got a great password. Number one. ID theft and financial fraud. Um, ID theft is the fastest growing crime in the country. Florida is number one as a state. Miami is number one as a city. Freeze your credit file. Monitoring doesn't help. Monitoring, like LifeLock, it's a good service and all, but it tells you that something happened. You know, I want to I want to stop it from happening. And you can unlock it for a day, or you you have total control. Doesn't limit you from doing anything you typically need to do with your credit file. Freeze your credit file. Number two, tax fraud is a huge deal. $22 billion last year. People stealing your social security number, going online to the IRS using some of the archaic technology that the government still has, and filing a return on your behalf and receiving a tax refund check. And what do you have to do? You have to go wait in line at the office in Miami for about two days to straighten things out, hopefully. What you can do now is file form 14039 with the IRS. Doesn't cost anything. Don't do it online. You can get the form online, but, but it's actually a honeypot for hackers. When you're doing it online, they're watching it and they're getting your pins. So send the form through snail mail. In a week and a half, you'll get it back. And it was built for those of, you, for those of us that had already had it stolen. You, don't, you can see the form, it says if you feel that it may have been stolen. You should feel that it may have been stolen. Just go with it. It's yes, I feel that it could have been stolen. Check it off, sign it off, form 14039, you got a pen. Uh, privatize your email accounts. You're on free email, it's like going outside without clothes on. It's like putting your mail without an envelope. It's called metadata, that's one word, M-E-T-A, data, metadata. That's a word you want to know for the future. It means information about information. You might think it's a very basic, simple email. No. The envelope, envelope of your email that goes through the internet says where you were, what you were doing, what kind of computer you're on, what kind of software, who you were talking to. There's so much information around it. So the Gmail servers, the AOL, the Yahoo servers, those are honeypots for hackers. And that's why Gmail accounts are just getting you know, killed these days. So privatize, and we, we, we do that for our customers. And what we suggest is, I have Deflin.net, my last name, .net. So my kids are at Deflin.net. They might still have their Gmail accounts, I can't stop that. But when I wanna send them a copy of their birth certificate or their passport or a visa or an ID, uh, insurance ID card, I'm doing it on our personal email account. All right, and that is our family digital domain. And it will last for more generations than I'll be around. And that's where they can all come back to and be safe from the rest of this madness. So privatize, be smart about it. But take it to the next level and use this technology faster, better, cheaper all the time to your advantage. So if you're just aware, you don't have to be a scientist or a mathematician or a coder or anything, just some awareness and feel empowered use the technology. What do I mean by that? Well, it's really almost as easy as pushing a button now with the right service. Might cost a few bucks a month to do it, but use these technologies to protect yourself. And these technologies are around real-time remote monitoring of your devices so that they use all this collaborative intelligence and protect them in real-time. Automatic updating and patching of all your software, very important. Uh, the collaborative element of threat intelligence we spoke about and using artificial intelligence and algorithms and big data to protect yourself. That's all built into these new cool products that are out there now and why I got in the business back in 2013 was to introduce that stuff to our new awareness of risk. So I say four fundamentals and we're going to wrap it up right now. Secure your device, that means antivirus, and monitoring and management. These are deeper than I can go through right now, but I just want to give you con conceptually the four fundamentals. Fundamentals: Secure your personal technology. Number two, protect the connection. When you're on Starbucks Wi-Fi in the airport, the hotel, use a VPN, virtual private network. Again, about five or six, well, maybe a little more, six dollars a month will encrypt everything automatically. You're invisible on the internet like that. All right, I have one on my phone right now. Number three, privatize your email accounts. We spoke about that. 
Back up and lock your data to a digital vault. It's not on the cloud, it's doubly encrypted, yet it's as easy as a free app on the phone to move all those documents that you would not want on a cloud, like IRS tax returns, healthcare records, scans of passports, that sort of thing. Again, five or six bucks a month for those types of things. So I would say, what can you do about it in conclusion? And you know, act as a leader for your family, for your community, for your business, for your practice. Bring these things to the table, as Dan said in his introduction. It's high time to talk about these things. And awareness and a few best practices go a long way. Number two, personalize the issues. You can't leave it up to the IT department. The federal government is just too far behind. They're not going to help you. They will someday in the future. This is a big social issue. They will subsidize us to protect ourselves in the future, I believe. But in the meantime, you can't leave it to the government, the corporation, the military, or the IT department. Take personal accountability, responsibility. Focus on individuals, right? It's not the big enterprise server-centric infrastructure. It's us on our mobile devices that are at risk here. So focus on the individuals and position yourself to benefit from this, from the innovation in technology. Be the receiver, not the victim. In conclusion, I have one more quote for you. It's mine, and that is, you know, the world's knowledge and information is a keystroke away now. It's at our fingertips. Fear and risk should not stand in the way. So thank you very much for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you.